Welcome to factors that affect reaction rate. There are five important factors that can control the rate of a chemical reaction. And most of these factors are related to collision theory. So let's take a look at collision theory first. Collision theory says that for particles to react, there has to be a collision. And this collision has to meet two criteria. First, it has to have enough speed or energy. And second, it needs to collide in the proper direction. So as we start looking at why some of these factors are able to influence reaction rate, keep this idea of collision theory in mind. Our first factor is temperature. And this is probably the most important one. Temperature is going to have the biggest effect on rate of reaction. More specifically, when we increase the temperature, the reaction rate goes up as well. So the question becomes, how does a temperature increase result in an increased reaction rate? Well, we know that an increase in temperature really means that the average kinetic energy of a sample is increasing. And this has two important consequences. The first is that if particles are moving faster in a given area, you're going to have more overall collisions. And if you have more collisions overall, you have an increased chance in seeing an effective or successful collision. So that's the first result of increasing average kinetic energy. The second result we see is that when you increase the average kinetic energy of the sample, that means more particles in the sample are going to have that minimum amount of energy needed to have the reaction in the first place. So that first part of collision theory that says the particles need to have enough energy or enough speed while well, increasing the temperature means that more of the particles will have that minimum amount of energy. So we would say that a greater percent of the particles have that minimum amount of energy or have enough speed. So this is also going to result in more successful collisions overall. The second major factor that contributes to reaction rate is concentration. And we saw the evidence for this in the last video about reaction rates. Increasing the concentration of the reactants results in an increase in the reaction rate. And that should make sense, because if I have more reactants in a particular amount of space, that space is more crowded, which means I'm going to have more total collisions. And if I increase my total number of collisions, I'll end up with more successful collisions overall. The next factor is surface area. Increasing the surface area of my reacting substances will result in an increased reaction rate. And this works in the same principle as concentration. I'm essentially trying to get more collisions to have more successful collisions. But it's a little bit different in that in concentration, I was physically adding more particles. Surface area talks about how those particles are arranged. Specifically, if I have a big block of reacting substance, the only area that reactions can occur is on the surface because collisions can only take place with particles on the surface. So I'm limited to collisions that can only happen in this pink highlighted area. If I now take this block and I cut it into four pieces, I get something that looks like this. These four pieces separated out a little bit. It's the same number of particles overall contained in these blocks of substances, but I've increased the surface area. So to see that, I originally had these edges exposed. And that's where the collisions could happen in the original sample before it was cut up. But by cutting up the block, I've increased the surface area because now these are surfaces as well. These are additional surfaces that weren't exposed before. And those are now new places that collisions could happen as well. So I've increased the total number of places collisions could happen. And you can see how this effect would be greatly magnified as I keep making these into smaller and smaller pieces. So we increase the surface area by making smaller pieces. This is one of the reasons that in cooking sometimes you crush or mince garlic instead of using an entire clove because those crushed garlic pieces will more readily give their flavor to whatever you're cooking than a, just a big chunk or a big clove garlic. The next factor that has a major effect on reaction rate is the presence of a catalyst. And a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of reaction without being used up or permanently changed. And the way it works is pretty interesting. A catalyst works by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. So essentially, it makes it easier to have a successful collision. And if it's easier to have a successful collision, you're going to have more successful collisions. We can look at an example of a reaction that happens faster in the presence of a catalyst. And the reaction we're going to look at is a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas.
Now this reaction will take place at room temperature on its own, but it happens really slowly. Here we have two test tubes. Both are filled with hydrogen peroxide, and it's at room temperature, so this reaction is currently happening. But it's happening so slowly, you can't really see it happening. Maybe every now and then if you look closely, you would see a bubble or two as the oxygen gas comes out of it. But I'm going to add a catalyst to the test tube on the right. When I add a catalyst, in this case manganese dioxide, you can see that the reaction occurs much, much faster to the point where you can see all the bubbles coming out because all the oxygen is being released all at once. The last factor we're going to look at doesn't relate to collision theory as directly as the other four, and that's the nature of the reactants. Some substances simply react faster than others, and that has to do with the fact that in order for something to react, bonds are broken and new bonds are formed. So when I say nature of reactants, what I really mean is the nature of the bonds in those reactants. And to get an idea of how the nature of the bonds in the reactants affects the reaction rate, let's look at some examples of reactions. The first is reactions between ions in solution, so ions that are dissolved in water. And we can look at the silver ion reacting with the chloride ion to form silver chloride, a precipitate. This reaction is going to happen very fast. And if you've ever done a precipitate reaction or seen one, you know that precipitates form very quickly. As soon as the ions come in contact with each other, that reaction happens practically instantaneously. On the other hand, reactions between substances with covalent bonds happen significantly slower. And we can actually refer back to the reaction we just saw, the hydrogen peroxide decomposing into water and oxygen, as an example. There's actually a connection to biology here. Most of the reactions that take place in your body are reactions involving covalent bonds. And those reactions would happen pretty slowly, but your body has special catalysts, and we call them enzymes. They're proteins that act as catalysts. And just like the manganese dioxide sped up this decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, the enzymes in your body make those reactions between covalent compounds in your body happen much faster than they would otherwise. The last thing I'm going to mention about nature of reactants is that, in general, you can always say that liquids and gases, or reactants in the liquid and gaseous phases, react faster than solids. That wraps up our lesson on the factors that affect reaction rate. Keep watching for a closer look at the effect of a catalyst and the effect of temperature on reaction rate from an energy standpoint. First, we're going to look at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. We already know that increasing the temperature increases the rate of reaction, but here we're going to look at why from an energy standpoint. This diagram should look familiar to you. It's the Boltzmann distribution for kinetic energy over molecules of a sample. We have the percent of molecules on the y-axis and kinetic energy on the x-axis. This graph essentially shows you that the majority of molecules have a somewhat lower kinetic energy, we have some molecules with very high kinetic energy out here on the right side. This dashed line represents the minimum amount of energy needed for a successful collision. On a potential energy diagram, we call this the activation energy. But this is a kinetic energy diagram, and it has a different name, although it represents essentially the same thing. We call this the threshold energy. And what this means is, at whatever temperature this is currently at, this area under the curve to the right of this line represents the total number of molecules with enough energy for a successful collision. Now let's see what happens when we increase the temperature. So I'm going to increase the temperature, which is going to increase the average kinetic energy of the entire sample. And what that does is it actually shifts the graph a little bit. So after increasing the temperature and raising the average kinetic energy, the new distribution of energy for molecules is going to look like this. You can see how the peak of this curve has shifted to the right, shifted to a higher kinetic energy state. But the result is that even more molecules have enough energy for a successful collision. And that's what causes our increase in reaction rate. Next we're going to look at the effect of a catalyst using the same diagram. So again I have my threshold energy here and that means that this many particles can have a successful collision. Now the catalyst works by lowering the activation energy, which means it lowers the minimum amount of energy 
needed for a successful collision. Well, on a kinetic energy diagram, that minimum amount of energy is the threshold energy. So if I add a catalyst, it doesn't affect the kinetic energy of the molecules, so the shape of the graph does not change. But it does move this threshold energy line lower. Okay, lower down the kinetic energy axis. So now instead of having just this small amount of molecules on the right that can have a successful collision, I've now also added this area in. And this is now the new area that represents the number of molecules that can have a successful collision.